Good. All right, let's open up our Bibles now, please, to the book of Luke, chapter 10, and uh, we begin reading in verse 25, in Luke chapter 10 and verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the word lawyer here is not like we would consider a lawyer that goes to court and defends someone or sues someone. A lawyer, in biblical terms, was someone who studied the law and gave his life to the law of Moses. And they studied the law from every angle, and then they taught that law to others. And so that's what this lawyer was here. And he came to Jesus, and he's tempting him. They, they did that often, trying to get Jesus to say something that they could then use to accuse him of uh, before the courts. And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? You're a man of the law. What does the law say? What does the Ten Commandments teach you? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. That summarized both tables of the law. The, the first commandments about all of our business to God, our relationship with the Lord, and then the other table of our relationship to others around us. And so both tables of the law, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And that summarizes, Jesus said, the whole law. Now, no one, we understand, no one's ever been saved by keeping the law, because no one ever keep it. And we understand the law was the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, and after Christ came, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. But the law does reveal the righteousness of God. The law reveals that, and it brings people to the conviction of how lost they are because they do not measure up to the righteousness of God, and they seek a Savior. And that's what the law does. And so he said uh, unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. Now the answer there is, he, Jesus is using that which should have brought him under conviction, which should have made him realize how far short he's ever come of loving the Lord his God with all his heart and all of his soul and all of his mind and all of his strength. Who in the world is ever honest and would honestly say, I've never, ever, ever thought that I could reach up to that standard? How many of us would be honest and say, I've never loved the Lord God with all my heart and soul and mind and strength and everything in me. I've always loved God that way. Yeah. That's what's required of the law. So we all come short. And then, uh, have we all always loved our neighbor as we love ourselves? Now that doesn't mean, by the way, that you have to love yourself. That's a misinterpretation, misapplication. We're never taught in the Bible to love yourself. That's not what that means. He's, uh, what he's saying when he's saying love your neighbor as yourself, he's saying love him as you would want to be loved yourself. You love your neighbor as you would want to be loved yourself. That's what he's saying. He, he ex explains it by saying do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Amen. There's nowhere in the Bible we're taught to love ourselves. We are to uh, love the Lord Jesus and love God, uh, and uh, we're to serve him with all of our heart and soul but there's too much self-love going on in the world today. Somebody say amen. amen. And you know it's true. Uh, by the way, I, I don't understand this. Uh, this is just a little side, a little, little free theology here. Where did this business come from where we're making all those selfies? Uh, do, do, do people think that everybody wants to see them? I mean, I mean, I mean, is, I mean, make a picture of yourself and put it on the network. You know, that to me, uh, I, that's, I just don't understand that philosophy there. What going, you know? Uh, and, I, and I hope none of you are guilty, but okay, go, we'll go on. And uh, he, verse uh, number 29, but he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, the reason he said this is because now he's beginning to think a little bit, love your neighbor as yourself, and maybe I've come short of that. Well, who is my neighbor? Now, the reason they also said that he also said that was because these who studied the law had interpreted it to love your friends and hate your enemies. And uh, so, is it okay to hate some people then? 
Now, the law never said that, but that's the way these lawyers interpreted it and gave it out. And Jesus said, you have taken your tradition and made them more than the Word of God, the traditions of man. And your tradition that you uh, are the one who can decide who you love and who you're not to love, that's not biblical. The Lord tells us that we're to love everybody. Even the unlovable. Because he does. And we're to be like him. We're never ever told to love their sin. We're to be like the Lord who loved righteousness and hated iniquity. And we're to never approve of wickedness. But we're to love the souls of men and try to get those men to Christ. We're to try to get everybody saved. We can get saved. And so we don't save anybody. But we want to give them opportunity to be saved. And get the gospel to them so they can be saved. So he said, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. My, this is a man who was on his way to Jericho from Jerusalem. He falls among thieves, and that means they stole everything he had. They stole his clothes, and they beat him up and left him wounded, left him half dead on the side of the road. Wow. And by chance, there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was in the place, at the place, he came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Now, one was the priest who was the highest order of the religion in Israel. This was the highest up there, the priest. And he just saw him over there and kind of turned away, and he didn't want to look at that. He moved right on. No compassion, no love, no grace. And then the Levite, now he was of the Levitical tribe. The priest came out of that same tribe. But uh, these weren't priests. They couldn't offer the sacrifices, but they did all the work around the temple and all the work uh, of the, of the uh, priesthood without offering the sacrifices. They were the Levites. And so the Levite came by, and he walks over to him, and he says, mm, isn't that a shame? That's an awful thing. Look at that, what they did to that man. They beat him up, left him bloody, left him wounded, stripped him of his clothes, took everything he had. Man, isn't that an awful shame? This is, this is a bad world we're living in. And then we went right on back and didn't do a thing for it. The next order of pe people who are the highest, the people that were highest, just looked and left. The next one came over and looked and walked away. And then Jesus said, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Now, the reason Jesus uses Samaritan here is because the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. You see, uh, what happened was, and to give you just a little bit of historical background, uh, you remember when you had the United Kingdom under Saul and uh, then David, then Solomon. There was each one of those served for 40 years. There's 120 years when the nation was all united with all 12 tribes. And uh, then when uh, Solomon died, his son Rehoboam came to the throne and he wouldn't listen to good advice and he caused, by his stupidity, caused a division. And the ten northern tribes left the two southern tribes. The ten northern tribes became known as Israel. The two southern tribes, Judah. And you had a divided kingdom now. Each one of them had then a king. We had Rehoboam in the south and Jeroboam up in the north. And what happened was these uh, kings that were in the north from Jeroboam on, they decided it would be a terrible thing if they allowed the people to come to Jerusalem and offer the sacrifices and to worship in the temple. And so what they did, they said, no, we're going to set up our own. And they put a couple of golden calves over at Bethel and Dan, and they said, these are your gods. And uh, every king that they had in the ten northern uh, tribes was an evil king. They never had a single king that ever called the nation to worship God. 
But now the two southern tribes, Judah, had some really good kings. They had some bad ones, but they had some really good kings also. And you hear the names once in a while, like Josiah, and, and you hear Hezekiah was a great king, and, and uh, Joash, and some of these were great kings. Okay, so now what's happened, the nation uh, of Israel had all these different prophets that came and prophesied to them and said, you need to get right with God. You need to turn from your sins. And, and uh, Elijah came and warned Ahab. And remember uh, the, the famine that came for three and a half years. Hey, you remember that? Well, all that judgment, he kept saying, you're going to be judged if you don't get right, if you don't turn from your w wickedness. God's going to bring judgment on this nation. And sure enough, about 720, 22 years before the birth of Christ, the Assyrians came, and they came down to Samaria, to the capital, and they out completely destroyed the ten northern tribes, scattered them all over the world. They just ran them off out of that territory. Now, there were some Jews that were left, just a, a handful of Jews left, uh, some say about 200 or so. And what they did, they refused the Assyrians refused to let them marry among them, themselves. They brought in others from the Assyrian Empire and intermarried with those people. And so these became a nation of half-breeds, half Jew and half Gentile. And that was one of the reasons they were so despised by the rest of the Jews who were purebred Jews. They looked down on them and they said, they're half-breeds over there. And uh, another reason they didn't care for them at all was because when that happened, they uh, then went up into Mount Gerizim and built a temple up there, and uh, they worshipped uh, from uh, Mount Gerizim. And uh, they had their copy of the, te the Ten Commandments and their copy of the first five books, the Pentateuch, the Torah, and, uh, and they interpreted it their way, and they said, we are the true Jew. And they did that while... The Jews were still in Jerusalem, still worshiping God down in Jerusalem, and uh, they were the true Jews. But these people told the lie that they were the real descendants of Abraham, and, and they were the true way to get to heaven. That made them that much more hated by the Jews in Jerusalem. Now, not long after that time, oh, about 115 years or so later, uh, the Assyrian Empire was run over, and their, their capital was Nineveh, and it was run over by the Babylonian Empire and under Nebuchadnezzar. And so Nebuchadnezzar then comes down, and uh, he attacks Jerusalem about 606 B.C., and uh, he carries a bunch of people captive. Remember Daniel and those three warriors? They all went down uh, to Babylon. And then in 586... He lays siege to the city and breaks down the walls and goes and tears the temple, that beautiful, glorious temple of Solomon. He tears it totally apart, tears up all the major houses, of the palaces, and destroys the city of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. Now, I'm giving you some history here. I know you're going to remember all these dates. Uh, uh, there's going to be a test after the service. <laughs> Seventy years later, in 536, actually 538, uh, the Babylonian Empire gets run over by the Medo-Persian Empire. You remember the night when there's the handwriting on the wall? Mene, mene, take care of you far, send our uh, weight into balances and art found warning. Your kingdom is divided into the Medes and Persians. Well, that's exactly what happened. And they came in about 538 or so. They took over, and Cyrus, uh, who was the Persian, he gave them permission in uh, 536 to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild uh, the temple, and uh, he wanted to get all that done. Remember that? And about 50,000 went back under Zerubbabel. You, you remember he went back, and, and, uh, and then about 80 years uh, later, 78 years later, uh, then Ezra went back, and he took another group, and then later on, Nehemiah came. And uh, about uh, 13 years later, in 445 B.C., he went in, and they rebuilt uh, the walls in troublous times. You remember those stories you read through the Old Testament. But now, when they did that, they started rebuilding the walls. They started rebuilding the temple. The Samaritans, who were still in that territory, 
began to mock them and gave them a hard time and tried their best to keep them from rebuilding the temple and rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And that was just one more nail in the coffin. And that's why the Jewish people just despised those Samaritans because they wanted to keep them from rebuilding the temple and rebuilding the walls of the city. So there was a great animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. Any Jew would have told you no Samaritan can get into heaven. There was no way possible that he could get into heaven. They were under the curse of God. And that's what they taught. Now watch this. Jesus said, a Samaritan comes by and looks at him and he comes over to him. He came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. Wine, there is, uh, a, a, was uh, an antiseptic. They poured in there to kill the germs and the oil was a healing. And to set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto them, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Wow. Now which of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? Had he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. Now you go and reach out to those, that Samaritan and you just have a fellowship with him because that Samaritan took care of you. Now watch this. You know the spiritual application here, don't you? Yeah, I mean, you know that we are the wounded ones. We've been wounded by sin and we've been uh, uh, walked on by that old sinful nature and Satan himself and he's put us down and wounded us and we're down and he comes and he doesn't just look. He doesn't walk away. He comes right where we are, and Jesus came right where we are and lifted us up and bound up our wounds, and he brings us to the end, the church, and then he tells the host of the church there, take care of him, and I'll repay you when I get back. We're going to see it when we see him face to face. There's a great application there, but there's a practical application here, and the practical application is very important also, and, and that is that we are to go and do likewise. What does that mean? It means we have a responsibility to those around us who are broken. Those of us uh, in this world who have been wounded. We don't, we don't know, folk. We really don't know when we see people how broken they might be. We don't know what a burden some people carry. We don't know what a load there is. Uh, it, it is it, it's heartbreaking when you hear of people who, uh, who commit suicide. Uh, I, I think I, I told you, um, I know most of you have heard that uh, I was pastoring a church, and uh, this man and his wife came to that church, and uh, very fine people. He was a principal of a high school very educated man, and she was a delightful person, loved the Lord, and they came to church, and they sat together, very nice, and, and uh, she always had a pad, she took notes uh, on my sermons. Uh, she always wrote down, and then after the message, she'd ask questions, and oh, she was gung-ho about uh, being in the church and serving the Lord. On a Saturday night, she called, and I answered, and she said, preacher, she said, I got great news. I led my neighbor to Christ. And she's coming with me tomorrow morning and going to make her public profession. And we rejoiced over the phone and praised the Lord for that. And um, so uh, we were excited. The next morning I got up. Now I had an early morning radio program. I was on the program 11 times a week on the radio. And this was an early morning, Sunday morning. And I usually did it at the station. I'd get up early and go down to the station because I like to do it live. And, and, uh, and, but I'd make a tape or two that they have in case others are need. So I'm getting ready to go to the radio station. The phone rings. And he's on the other end of the line. And he said, 
preacher, can you come to the house? And I said, well, then I, I've got to go to the radio station. He says, no, 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 no. He said, you need to come to the house. And he called her name. I won't call her name. And he said, she just killed herself. She just took a gun, a pistol, and put it in her heart and shot herself to death. I was absolutely flabbergasted. I was broken hearted. I, I didn't know what in the world to say. I said, I'll be there. And I left everything and I called the radio station and said, put on a tape. Uh, I won't be there this morning. And I went out to that house and there was a teenage girl and a teenage boy and the daddy and they were just bringing the wife out on the gurney, clothes covered over and took her out. And I, I, I wanted to have a prayer with the family, and I, I, it's the hardest thing in the world. And he said to me, he said, Preacher, would you do something for me? And I said, Brother, anything in the world I'd do for you, what, what do you want? Would you go back and clean up that mess that she made in the bathroom? I just about fainted. I said, yeah, I, I, I guess I can. He said, I don't have anybody to clean it up. So I went back, and there was the bedroom, and it was the bathroom off of the bedroom. And she had gone in and closed the door and leaned back against the door and shot herself. And the blood was two inches thick all over that floor all over the bathroom. I went in there and I had to take a cup and I took a cup and I turned the shower on and let the shower run and just scooped it up, that blood, scooped it up. And I sat and cried and cried and prayed. And I've never been so tore up in my life. And the thought came to me, did she miss something Wednesday night? Was there something that I could have said? Was there anything that I, that I could have said that might have changed that situation? Did, was I not sensitive to her need? I, I don't know. But then I said, no, it can't be because she was rejoicing. She had, she had won a soul to Christ. I said, I believe she got it. But something happened. And I, from that moment on, I bowed down and I prayed and I said, Dear Lord, let me look at every audience as if the last time I'll ever see them. This might be the last time you and I see each other. I don't know. You don't know. But I do want you to know that I want you to know the Lord and walk with God and love the Savior and be in fellowship with Jesus and have the joy of God in your soul. I want you to have the power of God and to serve the Lord with gladness and have victory in your life. And I pray for that, for you, that the Lord's hand will be on you and on your family. We've got a responsibility. The world's hurting. We don't know. We go out to the store and we pass somebody. We don't know that person might be on the tipping edge we don't know. They might, this might be their last day. We don't know. We must do all we can while we can. And to do that, we've got to follow the steps of Jesus and listen to what he said. He came and he had compassion on him. He observed him. He saw him. He didn't close his eyes to the need of these people that this man had. We cannot close our eyes to the need of people around us. People need the Lord. There's a, there's a song that, uh, that sometimes we sing, people need the Lord. People need the Lord. And it's in reality. And when we see people, we must not look beyond them. We must see them as souls for whom Christ died. It matters not their, uh, their status in society, whether rich or poor. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what clothes they wear, whether they wear 
uh, Harp Shapner remarks, uh, fine clothes, or whether they're wearing something from Wally. Uh, it doesn't matter. What matters is they're a soul for whom Jesus died. Every one of them. Every one of them. He saw him, and he had compassion on him. Did you know the Bible says over in the book of uh, Psalms, chapter 126, 5 and 6, He that soweth in, uh, in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. In other words, what he is saying, if we have a heart of compassion to others, if we see their need and our heart goes out to them, we have compassion on them. If we'll go then with compassion, we will come rejoicing with sheaves. We'll see the hand of God upon us. I, I have told you before a true story of a missionary in uh, Mexico who stopped a, a lady on the road and he said to her, I'd like to talk to you about the Lord Jesus. And she said, I'm not interested in that. I don't want to hear it. And, uh, and she said, uh, just move on away. And uh, she moved forward to get away from him, and she heard something. And she, she turned around, and, and he was weeping. He was audibly weeping. He was crying. And she said, sir, wh why, why are you crying? He said, because you didn't even let me tell you about my Savior. And she said, you care for me? You cried over me? And he said, yes, I, I want to talk to you about the Savior. And she said, in all my life, I've never had anybody weep over me. In all my life, I've never known of anybody who, who shed a tear over me. She said, I'll gladly listen to what you have to say. And he shared the gospel, and she received the Savior. It, it, compassion. We've got to have it, folks. And that's why he says at first, this man saw the need and had compassion. If we don't have compassion, we'll never win anybody. That's been so often said, and you've heard me say it, you've heard others say it, that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's a reality. It's true. People need to know that you care about their soul that you're concerned for them. I read this week, uh, as you know, uh, many years I, I traveled with uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship, and I was billed as Rondo the Great. <laughs> I was a magician, and I did gospel magic, and, and uh, I would go to North Dakota and set up a tent, and I'd put on a magic show one every hour on the hour, from, uh, from noon till 7 o'clock at night, every day for a week. And I'd go to the next city and do the same thing. Had hundreds of kids saved. But uh, Rondo the Great. So I've always been interested in magic. You know, in magic tricks and all that. Now, you know there's a trick to all of it. Now that. And, but uh, I, I, there was a program that came on TV called uh, Fool Us. Has anybody here ever seen that? It's, uh, yeah, it's, um, what? Pen and Teller. Pen and Teller, you've seen that thing. It's a magic show. And the, and the magicians came on and tried to fool them. And, uh, and you got some pretty good magicians on there. Well, they interviewed Pen. Uh, and Pen is the one that talks. Teller's the one that doesn't, you know. And he said, uh, we'd like to find out a little bit about you. He said, well, he said, uh, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. I don't believe anything about God. I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe anything about the Bible. I'm a confirmed atheist. But he said, I want to tell you something. I respect people who try to proselytize others to Christianity. Now, at this time, he had my interest when he made a statement like that. He said, uh, because, you know, if I believed what they say they believe, I would do my best to get everybody to receive Christianity. 
If I believed that he was the only way out of hell to keep out of hell, if I believed in hell and I believed what they say they believe about it, I would do everything I could to keep people from going there. He said, I respect those who go out and try to help somebody else come to Christ. You know what? I have more respect for that atheist than I do for some Christians that never reach, try to reach anybody. We have a responsibility. We have a responsibility. We have to have compassion on people. And the scripture said, he went to him. He went where he was. Uh, that's something that Jesus did for us too, you know. He came right where we are. He came to us and we've got to go. Did you know there's no place in the Bible that tells unsaved people to come to church? Now, I'll confess something to you. When I first started preaching back in the 50s, we could announce a revival meeting. And just by the fact that we're having a revival meeting, the house would be full. And there would be, be lots of unsaved people would come to the revival. It was, they would just come. They would, we're having a revival. They'd come. It's, it's not quite that way in our society now. You can announce revival, and God's people, the faithful will be there, but you'll have very, very few people who don't know the Lord that have come on their own. We're, we lived in a changed world. Back then, everybody knew the Ten Commandments. Back then, everybody believed the Bible. And now, we've had a generation come up in our school systems who deny the Scripture and teach evolution and all that other foolishness, and, uh, and they won't let them read the Ten Commandments and, and won't let them have a Bible in school. And so the kids have come up as pagans. That's what we have in this United States. And so we're living in a different time. And you know what the scriptures teach us? We've got to go to them. We've got to do it. He went where he was. That's what we've got to do. He, he came where he was. We've got to go out in the highways and byways. We've got to go and do what we can to get people to Christ and then by loving them, get them into church. You can love them in, and uh, get them under the sound of the gospel. My friends, look, it is our responsibility. Do you see that? It's a responsibility. Now look what he said. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. Now the oil, of course, speaks to us of the Holy Spirit. And the only way that people can get born again is with the Holy Spirit doing the work of God in their hearts. They must be born of water, natural birth, and of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings the life of Christ to them when they receive Christ as their Savior. They're born again, born from above, the miracle. But they must have the working of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we must be in union with the Holy Spirit and following His leading. And He will give us uh, ideas and a ways to do things if we'll walk with him and, uh, and we'll serve him that way. You know, you start talking to someone about the Lord, you have to talk their language sometime to get their attention. And it's very important to do that. Uh, I like to talk to people about where they are. And I, if I'm visiting the home and I know these people are lost, I'm going to talk about some of the art that they have on the walls and talk about things that they're interested in, some things that we can share that we're always in, and at least get on a talking basis where we can trust each other. Then you can show them the gospel, and you've got to do that. He came where he was. He went to him, bound up his wounds. You know what that means? Beloved, we've got to have compassion on people and don't put people down. The devil's made uh, havoc out of so many lives. He's destroyed so many lives. And we get along and we jump on the, and, and put them down and tell them what a shame you've gotten yourself in the shape you're in. That's no way to show compassion to anybody. We've got to go where they are and show compassion to people. We've got to care about people. 
I'm, I'm so sorry that you've had such a hard way. I really am. And I'm going to try to do what I can to help you. And I, and I know you've been struggling. And I'm here to be a friend. So much difference in that than, well, you've sure gotten yourself in a mess. You got what you deserved. No, that's no way to reach anybody. He went where he was, and he bound up his wounds. He tried to help him. He tried to minister to him. Look, we're ministers. We're to reach people. And he poured in oil and wine. And then he set him on his own beast and brought him to the inn and took care of him. You know what? I always like to do this. If I, I lead somebody to the Lord during the week, I, I like to tell them, now look, on Sunday morning, I'm going to come by and pick you up, and we'll just drive my car, because then we're going after the meal, after the service, we'll go get something to eat. And I'm going to come by and pick you up. I'm going to bring you my beast. <laughs> my Hyundai beast. Yeah, you know, you, you, you want to do what you can to help people and get them to the end. And... Uh, the church is a hospital. You know, the church is not a display room for God to show off his trophies. That's not a biblical concept. The church is a hospital for people to minister to people, to care about people, to bind up people's wounds, to get them to the great physician who can heal them and take care of their needs. That's our responsibility. And so he took him on his own beast, brought him to the inn, and took care of him. You know, the Lord took care of him, takes care of us. When we get somebody to the church, it's the Lord who will really take care of them and feed them and bless them. And by the way, if we have somebody come to our church and they don't know how to dress, or their boys' their hair is all the way down their back and all that business, how dare anybody to put them down? They just don't know better. They just don't know better yet. I had a man one time in church. We're trying to reach people, trying to have your folks saved, baptized, grow in grace, and serve the Lord. And these people invited this other, other family to come. And this girl came. And believe me, she would look more like a streetwalker than anybody going to church. Uh, honestly, she was not dressed for church, okay? You know what I mean. One of the men who was visiting, not a member of our church, stopped me, and he said to me, why don't you put that woman out on the street? She had no place in here. She ought to be in church. Look at the way she's dressed. And raised his voice at me. And I said, man, something's wrong with your heart. I said, if she, we can get her to Jesus, he'll take care of that problem. What, what about that sign that said, uh, you know, about reaching people? You catch them and I'll clean them, Jesus said. And he will clean them up. But my goodness, if you, if you put them out before they heard the gospel, they'll never be saved. They can completely just judge Jesus all the time because he went to the house of Pharisees and the house of publicans and ate with them. He didn't participate in sin, but he read where they were so he could talk to them about their souls. And we've got to have that concern, that care for others. We'll never reach anybody if we judge them. It's our business to reach them. And uh, the church uh, said, brought him to the inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave it to the host. <laughs> I, I think the host is the pastor. You know, I'm, I'm a little selfish here. And uh, because the Lord took care of him. And... Uh, you know, it, it, it's nice to be taken care of, you know. You know. And, uh, but I think he's also saying to each of us, if we win somebody, we have a responsibility to that person. We can't drop them. We win them, we've got to love on them. We've got to nurture them. We've got to care about them. We've got to continue to care for them and take care of them. 
And then when he comes, he'll reward us for it. That's what he says. Oh, blessed be God. Go and do thou likewise. Let's pray. Father.